All right, we are going to continue with Elephant Run by Ronald Smith, Chapter 8, The Christmas Ride. Nick sat up and groaned with difficulty. He got out of bed and made his way to the bathroom, slowly. It was hard to tell where one ache ended and another began. He and Maya had left the training camp soon after Hilltop had worked his miracle on Ba Shen. Nick still wasn't convinced the monk was one of the two original man hoots, but there was no denying the remarkable change in the bowl after the monk spoke to him. Ten and the other man hoots were hand-feeding Ba Shen by the time Nick had left the camp. When he stumbled into Hawk's Nest after the tour, dinner was waiting for him. He ate by himself at the long dining table, but he wasn't alone. Bung Kong, the head houseman, stood close by watching every forkful of food he put into his mouth, which made Nick a little uncomfortable. When he finished, he asked Bung Kong about Hilltop. A very holy man, Bung Kong said. Where did he go when he left the plantation? Some say he returned to India. Some say he went into the high mountains to stay in a monastery. And still, others insist that he had never left at all that he stayed right here in the form of an elephant until that elephant passed away and gave him back to us. Nick seriously doubted that, but didn't say so. Does Hilltop live in the village? Oh no, he lives in the forest. Where? Bung Kong shrugged his shoulders. No one really knows. Nick found this a little hard to believe as well. Why did he leave the plantation all those years ago? His wife and youngest daughter were attacked by a tiger. Like Hannibal, Nick said. Yes, but far worse. They were killed. After that, Hilltop shaved his head and devoted his life to the Buddha. Perhaps mother's fears of tigers was warranted, Nick thought. He asked Bung Kong about the Japanese invading Burma. They will soon be here, I think. How soon? I can't say. What do you think about the Japanese? Some want to see the British out of our country. Some want them to say. Day. I hardly think the Japanese would be better than the British, Nick said. Hong Kong smiled. Yes, but the Japanese have promised to give us our independence. He started to clear the table. If you'll excuse me, I have things to attend to. He limped off into the kitchen. Nick thought about this as he soaked in the tub. His father wanted Burmese independence too. During the last trip to London, he had lobbied Parliament on behalf of several plantation owners for Burmese independence, but the politicians turned a deaf ear to his pleas, and the newspapers attacked him, stopping just short of calling him a traitor. Nick came down the stairs a little easier than he had gone up the night before, but he was still very sore. When he got to the entry hall, he heard voices coming from the library. The door was open and two servants were lingering outside, pretending to clean, though it looked to Nick like they were eavesdropping. When they saw him, they gave embarrassed bows and scurried away. Nick walked into the library without knocking. His father was sitting at the helm. He had shaved, and his clothes were clean and crisp. He still looked tired, but much improved from the day before. He was glaring at the man sitting across from him with such intensity that he didn't notice Nick come in. The man said something in Burmese. His father responded in Burmese. And although Nick could understand the meaning of the words, the harshness with which they were spoken was clear. His freestone blood was up. Nick started to back out of the library, but his father saw him. Nick? Good morning, Nick stampered. I'm sorry. I, no, please come in, his father stood. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Nick said but it didn't seem anything like Christmas. I'd like you to meet, the man stood and turned around. Magui, Nick said. We met yesterday at the elephant training camp. Magui smiled, then bowed as if he and Nick were the best of friends. Nick returned the bow, but not as deeply, and he didn't smile. I was just telling Magui that I'm taking you on a plantation tour, his father said. We'll be gone a few days. It didn't sound like it didn't sound like that was what he was telling Magui. Three hours later, Nick sat behind his father, hanging to the elephant saddle for dear life. The elephant's name was Chu Chin Chow, Chow for short. And no matter how Nick shifted positions, each step the bull took jarred every bone in his body. 
His father didn't seem bothered in the least by the elephant's awkward gait, nor did Maya and Indal, who were about 50 feet in front of them on Miss Pretty. Every once in a while, Nick's father turned around to point out a tree, a shrub, animal, or landmark. Cobra, bad dispositions. Stay clear of them. Make sure to check for snakes before you sit down or hang your hammock. If you get a full load of venom, you won't last the night. Penguin, harmless. The young have the same armor plating, but immature. Their mothers carry them on their backs. But for the most part, they amble along in silence, which was fine with Nick. It saved him the bother of discuss, discussing his discomfort, which was getting worse with each step Chow took. If it didn't improve, he was going to have to confess confess what happened with Hannibal and risk becoming the laughing stock of the plantation. They rode through the morning without stopping, cutting through dense bamboo stands over blistering hot clearings, crossed cool streams, which Nick would have gladly jumped into, given half a chance. At times it seemed like they were going in large circles, but it was hard for Nick to tell because everything looked remarkably the same. Wild pigs, his father said, pointing to the right. It took Nick a while to pick them out in the dense brush. But there was at least a dozen in the group, standing still, not 20 feet away. They're good eating and plentiful in the jungle, his father continued. But the boars can be dangerous, especially when wounded. Food and survival seemed to be the theme of the tour, without any mention of teak elephants or a plantation management, which is what Nick thought they would be discussing. Do you shoot? His father asked. I beg your pardon? Do you know how to use a rifle? Nick's mother hadn't liked guns, and there wasn't much opportunity for target practice in London, although he had always wanted to learn. Not really, he said. We'll try to take care of that. A little afternoon, they came to a wide, shallow river and stopped. His father started untying various bundles and tossing them down to Indal and Maya, who had arrived well ahead of them. When he finished, he nibbly jumped to the ground. Nick dismounted too, but not nearly as gracefully. He hit the ground hard but his butt in, on his butt and nearly passed out from the pain it caused him. Fortunately, his father was busy and didn't see it. But Indal did. He rushed over. Are you all right? Fine, Nick said, which wasn't even close to the truth. Indal grinned and helped him up. I remember the first time I spent the day clinging to an elephant saddle, he said. I could barely walk when I got off. It takes a while to get used to it. Nick had been fully prepared to dislike Indal because of his father's obvious affection for him. But upon meeting him that morning, he found it impossible not to like him. The way he smiled, his mannerisms, and his good humor were infectious. It is more comfortable on the neck, Nick asked. Indal nodded but that also takes some getting used to. Nick wiped some of the dust off the seat of his pants and winced in pain. Are you sure you're all right? Indal asked. Maya tells me you had an accident on the trail yesterday. Yes, I, uh, I slipped. Did you tell your father? No, I wouldn't have told my father either, Indal said. You didn't break anything. I don't think so. I'm just a little sore. Indal stared at him in silence clearly waiting for Nick to elaborate. Well, Nick admitted, very sore. He wanted to tell him what had really happened. He felt Indal would understand, but there was nothing to be gained by admitting how stupid he had been. When we start again, Indal said, would you like to ride with me on this pretty? I'd like that, Nick answered. Where are we exactly? The river is called the Ta Kwa. Indal pointed across to the other bank. And that's not the shore you're looking at. It's a huge island with just as much river on the other side as on this side. Nick looked across the dense forest. Is it part of the plantation? Yes, his father said, joining them. Freestone Island. It's what all the land looked like when the sergeant major arrived. Wild, untouched. He wanted to keep the island away so we would remember how the plantation started. It's like a maze in there and very easy to get lost. No one allowed a cross unless I give them permission. We'll go over when it cools down. I wanted you to see it before he hesitated and looked at Indal. Where's Maya? She took Miss Pretty down river to give her a bath, he answered. His father nodded and looked back at Nick. Indal and I are going to see if we can find Hannibal. 
cannibals near here? Nick tried to keep the panic out of his voice. We've been tracking him all day, Indal said. There's a stream not far from here where he likes to hide. I think he's there. We'll take Chow, his father said. He and Hannibal are, are old friends. I'd ask you to come with us, but dealing with Hannibal can be a little dicey. I'll be fine here. Nick had absolutely no desire to go looking for Hannibal. Depending on how cooperative he is, his father continued, we'll cross over to the island in an hour or so. If we encounter problems, we'll camp here and go over tomorrow morning after we catch him. We're taking Hannibal to the island with us? His father nodded. We need to get him as far from the village as we can. If you get a chance, you might want to start a fire. We could use a cup of tea. Nick watched them walk away, then found the tea kettle among the supplies and walked to the shore. Maya stood in the cool river up to her knees, scooping water up with a bucket and splashing it over the prone Miss Pretty. Can I help? Maya turned around. If you'd like. He rolled his pants and waded out to join them. The cool water felt wonderful on his bare legs. What can I do? We use sand to scrub the elephant's skin, she demonstrated by scooping up a handful from the bottom and rubbing it onto Miss Pretty's gray skin, then rinsing it off. The cow seemed to love the bath, making satisfied high-pitched squeaks. When they finished the first side, Maya used her chune to get Miss Pretty to her feet, then laid back down on the other side. It took nearly an hour to scrub Miss Pretty down, and despite Nick's injured ribs, he enjoyed every minute of it. They tied Miss Pretty to a tree where she could browse. Then Nick walked upriver to fill the kettle with water while Maya got the fire started. The elephant bath had not only cooled him down, but it had helped him regain some of his self-confidence. The hit by Hannibal had done more than just crack his ribs. He decided to ask his father if he could spend a week or two in the elephant training camp. If he was going to run the plantation one day, he would have to learn a lot more about elephants. Maya knew a hundred times more than he did, and he wasn't even a man hoot, and she wasn't even a man hoot. Nick looked up from where he was filling the kettle and noticed a snag in the middle of the river with a vulture perched on it. The bird was eating something. He put the kettle down and waited out for a closer look. Happy for another excuse to get wet, the vulture flew off, leaving behind a monkey carcass. Other than its eyes being pecked out, the monkey looked relatively flesh, fresh. What do you see? His father shouted from the shore. Nick turned around. His father and Indal were back, and they weren't alone. Hannibal had a loose rope around his neck, tied to Cal's saddle. Sitting top of Hannibal with a cloth bag over his shoulder and carrying an old shoon was Hilltop. A dead monkey! Nick shouted back. Nick's father slipped off Chow's back, said something to Indal and the monk, then walked over to the edge of the water. He took his boot off and waded out to the snag. I guess Hannibal was feeling cooperative, Nick said. His father smiled. Chow's small, but he can be very convincing, and it didn't hurt to have Hilltop there. Is Hilltop really one of the original manhoots? He is. When did he come back? Right after you and your mother left. Where was he all those years? traveling, seeking enlightenment. How old is he? Old. But, as you can see, age doesn't seem to have slowed him down very much. They looked over at Indal and Hilltop. Indal was tying Chow to a tree. Hilltop was standing beside Hannibal, talking to him. So Hannibal's in a good mood, Nick said. Yes, much better than yesterday morning at the village when he knocked you down. Nick looked up in shock. How did you know? I just found out. Hilltop saw the whole thing. He followed you down from Hawk's Nest. You should have told me. Nick shook his head. I was stupid. No, you were lucky. Did Hilltop tell anyone else? Just Indal and me. Hilltop's about the only person on the plantation who keeps his own counsel. We keep it quiet to protect Hannibal. Protect him how? If certain villagers found out about the attack. By the end of the day, the story would be that Hannibal had gone on a rampage and tried to impale you with his broken tusk. There, there are those in the village who don't like me and will do anything in their power to undermine my authority. It is well known that I'm rather fond of Hannibal, in spite of his sour disposition. They can get at me by getting at him. Magui, Nick said. His father nodded. He's one of them. 
why don't you just kick him off the plantation? He's a conniving little weasel. But the truth is, I like him when he isn't trying to take over the plantation. And I have to think about his family, which is rather large. If I booted him out, then I would feel obligated to leave as well. It would be difficult for them to find work. I'm responsible for them. Nick looked toward the shore. Indol and Hilltop were hand-feeding Hannibal branches. Mr. Freestone followed his gaze. Hannibal is not the rogue everyone thinks he is. He's dangerous, to be sure, but yesterday morning he was just showing you who's boss. He could have killed you, but he chose not to. It was terrifying, Nick admitted. There's no shame in getting knocked down by an elephant. I've lost count of how many times it's happened to me. Did he break anything? I'm not sure. My ribs are bothering me. I'll wrap them up good and tight before we cross over to the island. Now, let's take a look at this monkey. He broke his stick off the snag and started probing the swollen corpse. Did it drown? Father shook his head. It was shot. Shot? Twice. He used the stick to point out the wounds. Why would anyone shoot a monkey? To stop someone from eating it. You're kidding. The hill tribes eat monkeys during lean times. And I'm afraid these are lean times coming to Burma. What are you talking about? Let's get out of the water, he suggested. They waded to shore. As they were pulling on their boots, his father said, the Japanese are here. Near the plantation? Yes, but not in any great numbers yet. He nodded toward the snag. I suspect the Japanese shot that monkey upriver. The soldiers are killing the hill tribes' food. If the tribes get hungry enough, they'll join the Japanese. Nick shook his head in bewilderment. Two years of bombings, their apartments destroyed. He had his fill of war. Why did the Japanese want Burma? They needed to move supplies in and out of China. And they're going to fight hard to take it. His father paused. I think they're going to win. But surely our soldiers? His father shook his head. We don't have the manpower to beat them. And most of the Burmese want the Japanese to win which is our fault. The Japanese slogan is Asia for Asians. We should have given the Burmese their independence long ago, or at least promised it to them after the war. But we built this country up, Nick protested. Any prosperity the Burmese have is because of people like you and grandfather and the Sergeant Major. We've worked hard, but so have the Burmese, he said, and this is their country, not ours. He tied his bootlaces and got to his feet. The situation is bad. We spotted a scouting patrol not five miles from the plantation yesterday. He took a deep breath, then locked his brown eyes on Nick. I made a serious mistake in bringing you over here. We thought you would be safer with me, away from the bombings. I wanted to come here, Nick said. His father looked away. I'm afraid your stay will be shortened than either of us expected. I'm sending you to Australia. I have a good friend in Alice Springs, and he's offered to look after you until all of this is over. Maya is going with you. Nick was too shocked to speak. It's not safe here anymore, his father continued. In a rush, before you, arrive in, before you arrived in Ragoon, I had Nag try to find a way to get you to the States or back to London, but everything was booked. People were leaving the country in droves. There wasn't a ship or airplane seat to be had. I only wish I had figured this out before you left to come here. The only way out now is overland to India. Indal will take you and Maya almost pretty. From there, you will board a ship for Darwin. What about the plantation? It's lost, his father answered. At least for the time being. Perhaps after the war, we'll be able to come back. In the meantime, I'm leaving Nog in charge of things here. What about you? He glanced away. I'll be staying here. To do what? To fight the Japanese. But you just said it was hopeless. The Burmese want the Japanese here. I said that most of the Burmese want the Japanese here, not all of them. And those who do will change their mind after they find out what the Japanese are all about. Indal and I will be leading a small group of men to make things difficult for the Japanese during their stay. We'll be gathering intelligence and sending it to allies so when they decide to take Burma back, they better be prepared. I was born and raised here. I know a lot more about the jungle than the Japanese. I'll be fine. 
So will I, Nick said. I'm not going to Australia. I'm not giving you a choice, Nicholas. It's Nick, and there are people younger than me fighting in this war. Indal isn't much older than I am. True, but you weren't raised here. It takes a long time to get acclimated. Some people never adjust to this country. He pointed to Nick's ribs, and you're in no shape to be running around the jungle. I'll be fine in a few weeks. His father shook his head. With luck, you'll be in India in a few weeks, and Alice Springs a week or two after that. You're not going back to Hawksness. You're leaving for India tomorrow. Tomorrow? This Christmas tour was just a ruse to get you and Maya away without panicking the villagers, he said. If they knew us pulling up stakes this early in the game, it's hard to say what they would do. Nick glanced over at Maya and Indal sitting near the fire. Does Maya know? She was told this morning. I asked her not to say anything until I had a chance to talk to you. She's as, as unha She is as unhappy about the situation as you are, maybe more so. She's never been further than Ragoon, which is another reason you need to go. She'll need your help. Nick doubted it. Maya didn't appear to need anyone's help, especially his. So you're not taking us to India. His father shook his head. I can't. They could be here in force any day. By the time Indal returns, Burma will have fallen. He took, he looked across the river, but before you leave, we'll go to the island to let Hannibal go. Why are you letting him go? Because that's where he was captured. And if we don't let him go, he'll be killed. The Japanese or someone from the village will make sure of that. We also need to determine how many elephants the island can hold. The military wants us to kill our elephants so they, they can be used, can't be used by the Japanese. I won't do that. Killing an elephant is like killing a person, as far as I'm concerned. Over the next few weeks, Nog and some of the other manhoots are going to take our best elephants secretly over to the island and set them free. His father stood. Let's get your ribs wrapped up. Wait a second, Nick protested. That's it? No more discussion? His father shook his head. There's nothing more to say, Nick. All right, guys, that is the end of chapter eight. We'll continue with nine a little bit later.